But let's move on uh, to uh, someone else. It's really great to welcome here, uh, Dr. Suman Sahai, a distinguished geneticist with positions in many American universities, now uh, heading up, among many other things, the Indian Gene Campaign. So come over to us from Delhi. All sorts of international awards, which I won't uh, embarrass Suman by mentioning now, but it's great to have you here, Suman. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, after that eventful lunch break. Um, I wish they'd listen in, because this is something so down their alley. We could invite our young friends in. But I want to talk about, um, as the theme of this session is, about kinds of sciences, kinds of knowledge systems, the power plays between them, what constitutes science, who are scientists, whose expertise counts, etc. And finally, um, it was only today in the, uh, in the morning session when Bob Watson brought the IK word on the table, indigenous knowledge, because there are sciences. There is the empirical science, the Western style of lab-derived science, and there is the other tradition of science, the indigenous science, which gets documented as indigenous knowledge, which is scientifically as valid as any other system of science. There's an enormous uh, lack of parity in the acknowledgement and recognition of these two sciences, and that plays upon the kind of power structures that stand behind these constructions of science and, and creations of, of knowledge systems. Indigenous science is extremely relevant. It's scientific. It may not be credible across cultures, but does it have to be? If problem solving is to be local, then it has to be credible locally. And the creation of indigenous knowledge and in the, in the establishment of indigenous science is credible to those cultures who are aware of its robustness, its relevance, and if it's, its efficacy. So I don't think that these things have to be credible across cultures. They have to be credible <coughs> to a situation where they are relevant. However, perversely enough, they have been, these systems of knowledge have been transported across cultures by a phenomenon that we are all familiar with, biopiracy. So whereas systems of healing and medical traditions will not acknowledge these forms of, of uh, healing or, 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 or uh, medical science, but the corporations have managed to take this up across cultures. And if you see the kind of mega blockbuster drugs that are being derived from medicinal plants backed by indigenous knowledge, there's no such thing as a medicinal plant without its knowledge base, without the science that, uh, uh, that is its base. And if you think about the sophistication, it's no wonder then that corporations have taken it across cultures. When a, when a tribal person walks through a forest, he or she sees an entire pharmacopoeia. That's how sophisticated and expensive this scientific expertise is. That yellow flower is a treatment for glaucoma, but not for arthritis. That blue one is a treatment for arthritis, but not for uh, diabetes. That one there is for diabetes. So this knowledge system remains unacknowledged, but exploited uh, at various levels. And I would submit that it is in our interest, in the interest of the global community, in the interest of communities that are debating knowledge systems and scientific expertise, to, to try to benefit uh, from all systems of knowledge, from all scientific expertise, and to try in all our respective uh, situations to highlight the importance of these kinds of sciences to problem solving, uh, not only for the communities, but for all sectors, to the corporations, or to us as consumers of, of uh, medicines. It is important to bridge the distances between these knowledge systems. And it is important to keep in mind that the latest is not always the best, and the old is gold. So I rest my case on the knowledge systems that are created under different conditions. Science is not just biology, or for that matter, chemistry and physics. Again, it's, it's a subliminal thread that's been there for some uh, time that social sciences and other sciences are also sciences. And yet, in the, in the domain of scientific expertise, in the domain what governments ask for, in the domain that is submitted to governments, and this is very true of developing countries. It is only the hard sciences. So it will be a lot of people who come from biology, and it's going to be increasingly biology with the 21st century being the century of biology, that are going to advise governments based on, on 
the so-called hard science. But we know increasingly that we are going very, very wrong in, in creating scientific expertise and recommending scientific expertise for public policy or for pro problem solving by ignoring this component. And I submit before you a, a theoretical case. I mean, hindsight is always 2020. But consider the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution was created by genetics, agronomy, a little bit of plant breeding, perhaps a little bit of uh, physiology. But it was created by those hard sciences. Had there been the vision at that time to study the socio-economic impacts of the Green Revolution, we might have had a different Green Revolution. I don't trash the Green Revolution, but I do see its limitations. And perhaps had we had the wisdom, and if we were to have the wisdom even today, of marrying these two sciences, or these many sciences, then we might have had the potential to combine the high yield potential of the high yielding varieties with sustainability. Because all the things that Bob Watson was saying in the morning are absolutely true. I mean, the Green Revolution led to a huge skewedness. It led to a huge skewedness in, in public investment. It was not a holocaust, but it was discriminatory. It led to a skewedness in in the kinds of agricultural systems that were um, favored because they achieved the goals and led to the neglect of rain fed agriculture, which is biodiverse, which is in the longer term sustainable, which is also something that communities can deal with much more on a one on one basis. Now, I'm not trying to romanticize that kind of marginal uh, sustenance agriculture necessarily, but it has got huge advantages that got completely thrown by the wayside. Because you went for this one dominant paradigm that had been created by biology, genetics, physiology, and completely ignoring the other, the other aspects of what should constitute scientific expertise and does not. Curiously enough, ag biotechnology seems to have picked up these trends. If you look at the Cartagena Protocol's recommendations on, on GMOs, you'll find socioeconomic establishment of socioeconomic uh, paradigm as being one of the constituents for deciding on a GMO, it's there on paper. It's being richly sabotaged by vested interests, but it's there on paper. It has entered the discourse. That discourse is not being encouraged. The other thing that has entered the discourse through the, uh, again through the Cartagena Protocol, is the precautionary principle. Now, as technologies get more and more transformative, and they are, and, and ag biotech is just the beginning, we'll be dealing with nanotech, we'll be dealing with synthetic biology, we'll be dealing with all the olomics. The technology adoption is getting crazier and faster. And the precautionary principle, which is a natural adjunct to, this, to the creation of this kind of technology, has just been merely flagged, but is not used. So both of these features, the socioeconomic impact of technologies, and the precautionary principle in the case of transformative technologies are two things we should take on board as completely integral features of developing scientific expertise and creating scientific models that we want to recommend. Here is also valid to go into who is the expert. For the longest while, the expert has been the other. The expert is that which the community is not. And the expert is this lofty, distant creature that talks down at you. This is the doctor with the MD and the FRCS and the MS who treats the patient, but does not, the patient has no participation in that kind of, uh, kind of interaction. As against that is a system of uh, healing. For example, in any of the traditional systems, it's, I'll give you the example of Ayurveda where the patient is a source of expertise without which the treatment cannot begin. So the doctor relies as much on his or her own skills, the ability to read many of the symptoms, but relies on the patient's detailed description of his or her condition. And together, that constitutes the treatment paradigm. And now, increasingly, the stakeholder is also now being considered nascent early days. But the stakeholder, the patient, the other to the expert, the holder of the expertise, is becoming now considered as a source of expertise himself or herself. And I will come later to an instance. It's a process that has begun 
in the United States, very interestingly so. Constructing expertise. And here we must acknowledge that the enormous role that money and political power is playing in the current construction of scientific expertise. <coughs> expertise of all kinds, but scientific expertise particularly. There is such a huge investment of money in the creation of scientific expertise, particularly in these new biologies, because these new biologies are transformative, they're privatized, they are the big money spinners, or they're anticipated to be the big money spinners. And that investment of money and political power is to be protected. And you can see the constructs evidently in your face. I was at a, at a meeting at the National Academy of Sciences in Washington on, guess what, GMOs. And this was, say, like about five years ago. We were trying to, or the conference had been, had been staged, I would say, to discuss the pros and cons of GMOs. It's their, their great application and relevance to developing countries, saving my poor countrymen from being starving to death. And guess who was there in large numbers? The American State Department. Uh, totally flummoxed, I asked this gentleman, I said, what the hell are you doing here? I mean, this is a <laughs> conference of, of scientists. And he says, well, you know, I mean, the disdainful way that the State Department people and immigration people have of looking at that little worms. We are responsible for this technology in the United States of America. And so it is. It is the State Department. That is the kind of manifestation of the political power that attends this technology. I mean, GMOs have gone completely out of the window. They're so off the bat that it's, a, it's amazing. It's a, it's a very good example of how you can totally pervert all scientific principles that all of us have learned from high school onwards. But what the role of science is, what is all of this public good thing. But the amount of money that is going into to the creation of new technologies is also leading to a, a concurrent phenomenon. And that is the sequestration of this knowledge. So you have the privatization, the corporatization, leading to insane amounts of money being invested in these technologies. These insane amounts of money have to be protected. So you've gotten into an intellectual property rights regime. And uh, you are implementing this whole IPR thing on, on science. And I actually recall uh, we organized, when I was at Heidelberg, we organized a symposium with scientists, particularly with geneticists and biologists, about how they felt about seed patterns, gene patterns, patenting of biological materials. And you could see the face off between the lawyers and the legal people and the scientists. But what, to my dismay, I also found was a large chunk of the scientific community saying, talking the lawyer's language. So today we find that the science master may be making heavy tracks in the direction of the patent office, not so perhaps in the, in the direction of the tutorial. This is what the privatization and corporatization of science is doing. It will have its implications for the transmission of science to the next generation. When we learned science, we learned on the backs of other scientists. The next generation, I don't know whose backs they'll be learning it on. But there is this whole perversion happening in what is science, what is technology, because of the investment uh, that is going into it, because of the political power that is controlling it. But interestingly enough, this is also leading to this enormous rejection of science and technology that is happening across the younger generations. The younger generation is articulate, confident, is not overly overawed by authority, is challenging hierarchies, and is very critical of which kind of scientific expertise it is willing to accept. A lot of this is informed by, by what they see as the privatization of science, the privatization of technology. And this rejection, I mean, you see the, the demos and protests against technology now increasingly, and I don't think this is going to change in a rush, because this whole thing has become obtuse, non-transparent, non-participatory, non-sharing, sequestered, ivory-towered, fulfilling the interests of just a few vested interests. Nothing 
contained in it. Of, I mean, I'm saying this all very, very sharp and rhetorically black and white, but this is how this, these kinds of developments of science and technologies are now being perceived. Along with this is the other process that we are seeing, and that is the subversion of the peer review process. I mean, the peer review process for this was this holy grail of scientific endeavor. And all scientists, I mean, this one goal that they had in life was to publish in a peer reviewed journal and receive the accolades, not of money, but of the recognition of their peers. So the scientific peer review process was a very, very important part of retaining the integrity and the purity and the hallowedness of scientific expertise. And that is why it was acknowledged, and that is why it was deferred to, and that is why it was given this hallowed status from which it is rolling down rapidly now. Let me give you an instance of what the peer reviewed process can do. I mean, you've all followed the old tobacco debates when even journals as venerable as Lancet and BMJ were publishing um, articles that, that nicotine had no connection with cardiovascular disease or with, or with lung disorders, etc. From there came the, chemi the chemistry and pharma articles and now you have the GM articles. So the peer review process, the disintegration of the peer reviewed process in scientific journals of repute is cause for extremely high levels of concern. We as a scientific community must be bothered to death about this. Because then where are you going to do standard setting? Where are you going to, where are you going to recognize the bar, never mind lower it or, high, or raise it? And the disintegration of the peer review process, I mean, I will, I will recall for you an example and where it has led to. In February of 2002, there was a publication by two scientists, uh, Kolkheim and Silberman. This was a science paper in which the authors suggested that the, the planting of Bt cotton in India led to an 89 percent increase in cotton production. That was the quantum of rise in yields by the adoption of Bt cotton. <coughs> Many of us who work on Bt cotton, and Gene Campaign has been working on Bt cotton from day one, we analyzed the paper and saw that the paper had rested on data from the company's controlled trials. At the same time, there was the first Bt cotton crop in the field. And Gene Campaign ultimately wrote the first ever analysis of the Bt cotton performance. But Kyle and Silberman wrote a paper showing 89 percent, not on the proper fields of Bt cotton, where it was being cultivated, but on field trials belonging to the company, belonging to Monsanto. There were howls of protest. Many people wrote off that this is false, that this is incorrect. And this came from many quarters. We wrote off and so did a lot of other scientists. Science did not publish one single letter. That is cause for concern. If you are going to construct scientific expertise and expect it to be respected, you can't have um, processes like this going through and you can't have scientific journals of that repute and that standing sort of playing ball. So along with, the, along with all of this is not surprisingly the huge distrust of experts, the rejection of scientific expertise and the desire to, to say that all technology is bad. So what should we do? What should we do as the scientific community, as people who are interested in science, who believe in science, and who see its great value, or of sciences and see their great value in, in contributing to the formulation of public policy or, or solving the problems of communities, etc. I think one thing is to marry the different kinds of sciences. But as an academic community, something that we haven't done, I would like to put before you that we should do and that is to distance ourselves from bad science. Too often we are reluctant to speak out against scientific colleagues. This is going to cost the whole community very dear. When there is a Kaim and Silberman paper, then I think there should be public condemnation of that process. And if the scientific community is able to make the distinction demonstrably and publicly of what it considers good science and bad science, clean science and compromised science, then I think we have a hope of getting science back where it belongs in the hallowed portals. Thank you.